Shalom. This week's Torah portion is Parashat Mitzorah, beginning in Leviticus chapter 14. By this time, halfway through the book of Vayikra, it's become clear to us that this book is the manual for serving God. Thus, it's God's manual for us to discover so much about ourselves, because self-knowledge should lead to self-mastery, an admittedly difficult goal, but what it really means to serve God. And we're beginning to understand that both the experience of bringing an offering in the temple, as well as the concept of the spiritual recalibration called tahara that we began to learn about in last week's portion of Tazria, it's all a part of a plan for the benefit of man, to enable him to constantly grow closer to God by refining his base nature and developing his spiritual side, addressing and presenting opportunities to fix core issues and the negative attributes that keep him from growing. None of this is for God. He doesn't need anything from us. Everything we're learning about in Leviticus is intended to instill in us a wondrous, advanced, sensitive, highly developed consciousness, divinely designed with the love and compassion for man that only the God who created him could have made, crafted to help keep us in focus and not get bogged down and bedraggled by our base instincts. So open up your heart. This week's Torah portion of Parshat Mitzorah continues with laws relating to the mysterious ailment known as Nega Tzarat that we began to learn about in last week's Torah portion of Tazria. Tzarat is a peculiar, uh, an anom- anomalous affliction which no longer exists. And it's unknown to the world. In fact, even when it did exist, the only people in history who were ever visited by this affliction were the children of Israel, and even then, only for a certain period once they entered into the land of Israel, which God gave them as a possession. While it's often translated as leprosy, and indeed the same Hebrew word, tzarat, is used to refer to that infectious disease called Hansen's disease, which is also known as leprosy, this tzara that figures so prominently in this week's Torah portion, as well as last week's Parshat Tazriah, is not a medical condition at all. Our sages teach that tzarat is not a physical disease, but a spiritual affliction connected on a completely spiritual level to the sins of evil speech, known as Lashon Hara. Torah forbids the speaking of any words about another person, even if true, and even if ostensibly not derogatory, if those words can cause any sort of embarrassment, anguish, or fear, or any sort of damage, physical, family, financial, or otherwise. Even if totally true and said over in innocence, Torah still forbids such speech. It's forbidden to speak, forbidden to hear, and it's forbidden for the listener to believe. Our sages discuss this connection between Lashon Hara, evil speech, and Sarat, explaining that just as physical disease affects a person's body, Lashon Hara affects a person's soul and spiritual health. Torah itself testifies to this, as we find in Numbers 12.12, regarding the Tzarat incident of Moses' sister Miriam, who was punished in this manner for instigating negative talk against her brother Moshe. So Tzarat is direct cause and effect, a physical manifestation of a spiritual malady, divinely visited upon those guilty of gossip, slander, or other forms of harmful speech. This affliction was seen as divine retribution, but tempered with great kindness, for it served as a self-awareness check for those who engage in such behavior, a wake-up call to repentance. When evil speech is directed against an individual, that person is often socially ostracized and made to suffer the loneliness of alienation and isolation. Thus, after having been diagnosed, and not by a medical doctor, but by the only one Hashem authorized to diagnose, a Kohen, a temple priest, once diagnosed, the sufferer, called a Matsura, once stricken with Sarat, his first step towards rehabilitation is to quarantine himself, to be alone, to begin his journey towards self-knowledge, to be by himself, where he can engage in serious introspection, to start the process of cleansing himself by working on subduing his evil inclination and crying out to Hashem for his healing. So rather than view this as a punishment in the classic sense of the word, we can understand it as an example of the intimate bond that the God of Israel has with his people. Even the very word mitzorah itself conveys awesome lessons of divine kindness. Torah calls the antagonist mitzorah 
because he is motzi shem ra. It's a contraction. He causes the subject of his talk to get a shem ra, literally a bad name. But the word also alludes to motzi ra, meaning simply to bring out the bad in the sense of providing the speaker, the guilty party, with the opportunity to undergo a powerful catharetic process whereby, by empathizing with the plight of him who, whom he spoke against and damaged and caused to be isolated, he can now begin his own process of healing, motzi ra, to expunge the, negati the negativity from within his own soul. As part of the purification process that Torah prescribes, two live, clean birds are taken. One is slaughtered over spring water, and then the live bird is set free upon the open field, reminiscent of King Solomon's words in Ecclesiastes 10.20, for the bird of heaven shall carry the voice, and the winged creature will tell the matter. What is the significance of these birds? Jack Dorsey, co-founder and former CEO of Twitter, now called X, explained how they originally named the platform Twitter, and I quote, We had been searching for a name and came across the word Twitter, and we said it was just perfect. The definition was a short burst of inconsequential information and chirps from birds, and that's exactly what the product was. End quote. And everybody knows that the vast majority of what transpires there, that is, what is not downright hurtful, is pointless babble and shameless self-promotion. So this Mitsora's destructive, garrulous speech was reminiscent of a bird's incessant chirping. Now, while suffering from his tzarat, his experience will be like that of another bird, the lonely bird upon a rooftop of Psalms 102, verse 8, denied the company of others, and now, after his rehabilitation through quarantine, he can return to society, like the bird that was restrained and now set free to fly. Both the bird set free and the bird that is slaughtered symbolize the individual's return to normal life in the company of others. The bird that is slaughtered over spring water, called by the Torah living waters, represents the Mitzorah who until now was likened to one who is dead, but has now returned to the side of life, to the company of the living, like the bird set free to fly, symbolizing his transition from solitude to society. In his purification, he takes a bit of cedar wood. The cedar is a towering lofty tree and it was a spirit of haughtiness which drove this individual to speak against another person, whom he looked down upon. But now the experience of isolation that his tsarat affliction has caused has brought him down to size. Thus he also brings a bit of hyssop, a lowly plant, as well as crimson thread whose color is obtained from a lowly worm, both symbolizing humility. Two more therapeutic steps whose symbology contributes towards the tikkun of the arrogance that caused his sin. An affliction of tzarat can appear in a person and also in a garment. This is obviously no ordinary disease. In our portion of Mitzorah this week, we learn that tzarat can even appear in houses. As our sages teach, let not a person say, who would bear witness against me? For the stones and beams of a person bear witness against him, as Chabakuk the prophet says in chapter 2. For a stone will cry out from the wall, and a sliver shall answer it from the beams. As in the case of the appearance of an affliction in the body, here too, the officiating Kohen, functioning as the spiritual doctor, has the exclusive authority to make a determination. First, he commands that the contents of the house should be removed before he arrives to make his diagnosis, because if he should need to declare the house quarantine, then it would happen that everything in the house would be rendered impure. If he determines that the house is indeed afflicted, he quarantines the house for a seven-day period. If on the seventh day he sees that the condition has spread, the affected stones and mortar have to be removed and replaced and replastered. If the affliction returns, despite the removal of these stones, it is indeed declared to be malignant sarat and the house is declared contam contaminated. The house has to be completely demolished. Midrash Tanhuma expresses an idea that Hashem's conveyance of sarat comes in stages. In his patience and mercy, he waits to wake this person up, to give him a chance. The Midrash says that Tzarat was visited upon a person in the opposite order, which appears in the verses. First, a nega, an affliction, appears in the walls of a home. It's removed from the person himself by two degrees of separation. If the individual gets the message and returns to Hashem, all is well. If not, an affliction appears in his garments. The message is getting closer, closer to his person. If he gets it this time and returns to Hashem, good. If not, the affliction appears in the skin of his flesh. 
These are concentric circles progressively getting closer, starting from without and from further away from the person and moving inward. But here's the thing. Okay, so I understand that it's not nice to speak badly of another, but why should God establish in his holy Torah such an elaborate and detailed program to address and rectify an issue which, in the grand scale of the list of man's many faults and moral deficiencies, may ostensibly strike us as a relatively minor offense com compared to other far graver sins. So now open up your heart in the deepest way. It's because negative speech is a desecration of God and man and self-destructive to man's very soul. Because after all, what is man's soul? Torah states explicitly that it's the essence of God within him. Genesis 2, 7 states, and he blew into his nostrils the soul of life and man became a living being. Man's soul of life is the breath of God. The divinely inspired Targum Unclus wisely translates a living being as a speaking spirit, meaning the breath of God within him makes itself manifest as his ability to speak. It's man's unique power of speech that distinguishes humans from animals. While animals communicate through instinct, humans have the ability to use speech to express abstract ideas and emotions because the essence of the divine soul is connected to the power of speech. Our speech is formed of letters that in turn make up words. The Zohar, the foundational text of mystical knowledge, explains the significance of the Aleph Bet, the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. The letters themselves were used by God to create the universe. Each letter is a vessel for divine energy, for they give expression to the will of the Creator. Our ability to speak is also a reflection of God's creative power. Just as God spoke and brought the world into existence, human speech has the power to create and destroy, to build up and tear down. Proverbs 18.21 states, Death and life are in the hand of the tongue. So the sages of the Talmud ask, And does the tongue have a hand? But they answer, This verse teaches that just as a hand can kill, so too the tongue can kill. That's the power of negative speech. So the words we speak have a profound impact on ourselves and the world around us. Our words can create and shape reality in a spiritual sense. And conversely, it's the power of speech that enables us to articulate the profound truth of Hashem's sovereignty in this world. And the power of prayer is an example of a form of positive speech that can bring about miraculous change in this world. Prayer has the power to bring about sp spiritual and personal transformation both for the individual as well as for others. One prayer, if said with all one's heart, can change the entire world, can even change the course of history. So it's precisely in light of the divine origin and nature of the power of speech that we can understand why the abuse of this power is extremely destructive and why Torah deems the sin of Lashon Hara, the evil speech of talebearing and gossip, to be so severe. But open up your heart deeper still. I still have another question. There appears to be no indication in Torah that Sarat will reappear in the future. The general understanding of all the sages is that Sarat was limited to that very specific time period and is not expected to recur again. Today we're not even worthy to receive this divine signal. Our sages tell us that this outer revelation of a diseased soul was only manifest for the generation of knowledge when a sinner was still the exception to the rule. In our time, there's no place for this manifestation because we would sadly all turn into Mitzoraim. But if that's the case, and we know that Torah is our divine guidebook for life, and extremely precise and economical and careful with every word, then if it will not appear again, why does the Torah spend so much time on this affliction, dedicating two entire portions, Tazri and Mitzorah, to a subject that is merely history? So on a simple level, we always believe, first of all, that every word and commandment in the Torah is meaningful and worthy of study and contemplation. But the deepest truth is that the problem of evil speech, which began in the Garden of Eden, isn't going anywhere fast. Although the laws of Tzarat were only relevant to the Israelites at that specific time, they also contain lessons for spiritual growth and ethical living that are relevant in perpetuity. Torah deems the message these portions convey regarding the severity of evil speech to be an internally, eternally intrinsic aspect of the Jewish people's journey and their relationship with God. And besides, remember that Sarat was a physical manifestation of spiritual impurity resulting from negative speech or behavior. In our time as well, negative speech and harmful behavior can still evoke divine response. 
in a broader spiritual sense and have detrimental effects on individuals and communities, even if they do not result in physical skin afflictions. In his seminal work on the laws of evil speech, Chafetz Chaim, the saintly author Rabbi Yisrael Meir Kagan, writes that Lashon Hara is a sin that encompasses many other sins, as it often leads to strife, and hatred, and other transgressions. The Midrash compares the destructive nature of Lashon Hara to the three most severe sins of idol worship, murder, and illicit relations, stating that speaking evil is equivalent to all three sins combined. Not only does it cause harm to individuals, damage relationships, and harm the fabric of the community, it also has severely negative spiritual effects, causing a blemish in the soul and greatly weakening one's spiritual standing. If the sin is repeated and becomes a cycle that one does not rectify, the damage on the soul level becomes irrevocable. Talmud goes so far as to state that one who speaks Lashon Hara is considered as if they deny the very existence of God because it shows a lack of faith in divine providence and God's control over the world. Open up your heart deeper still. The Holy Baal Shem Tov taught that a person's life force is quite literally diminished by speaking Lashon Hara. When a soul is born into this world, the individual is allotted a certain amount of words, a word budget for all the days of his life. But these forms of negative speech subtract from his words, and when his words are used up, his time is up. Thus, we must be wordly wise. Positive words of Torah and prayer, goodness and joy and faith and encouragement are not reckoned as part of the budget, and thus, one's holy words, accompanied by repentance, can replenish his days and help to undo the damage that he's caused himself. And a person even merits to cling to Hashem in this world and can even merit to divine inspiration through speaking pure speech. Every word we speak is an act of creation. Upright words, good words, not only of Torah or prayer, but, but words expressed to cheer another person, words of truth and help and loyalty, of love and peace and wisdom. These words create an angel, a good angel, an angel of defense, a defense attorney. Negative speech creates a negative angel, an angel of accusation. So open up your heart deeper than ever before in your whole life. It's the profound spiritual significance of the power of speech that links our Torah portion with the celebration of the upcoming Chag HaPesach, Festival of Passover, and the Seder night. The telling over of the miracle of the Exodus on Passover night is a central theme of the festival, and it's a special mitzvah to expound upon the story of the Exodus on Seder night. This retelling of the story evokes our feelings of gratitude and awe for the miracles and wonders that God performed in redeeming the Israelites from slavery. But we also believe that the Exodus story is not just about the past, but also about the future redemption of the Jewish people and all humanity. And this is the time not only to express hope and faith in the coming of a better world, but also to activate our own personal redemption with each individual undergoing their own exodus from personal limitations and spiritual bondage. Exodus 13, 8 states, And you shall tell your son on that day, saying, It is because of this that Hashem did for me when I left Egypt. With these words, Torah teaches us that the key to this personal redemptive process is through the power of speech. By using our words to express gratitude and praise and kindness, we elevate ourselves and our surroundings bringing ourselves closer to God and closer to the attainment of our true spiritual potential, striving to become members of that righteous society envisioned by Torah. May we use our words wisely for good, for praise and thanks to Hashem for all the miracles in our lives. And may we merit as individuals and as a world, may we merit to the ultimate, final, wondrous and perfect promised redemption. Chag kasher Blessings for a joyous and kosher Passover.